Half the battle is back. It's me, Daniel Levy, your host. We're going to be recapping UFC 205. And joining me now to recap UFC 205 is the Thai guy himself, Matt Maria. Matt, welcome back to Half the Battle, man. Thanks, Daniel. Good to be back. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. I mean, dude, UFC finally came to New York. You're from New York. I mean, everyone remembers you from the the first 205 press conference. And, I mean, what was the atmosphere like having uh, the big show in town? Yeah, I, I tell you, it was definitely the biggest event that I've seen um, in a long time here in, in New York. I mean, we got these events here and there, but this was by far the best the greatest and the, and I feel like the largest I believe that they hit the they broke some kind of record in Madison Square Garden that previously I believe a, a boxing I think it was Linus Lewis and maybe Holyfield had um had that record so so yeah it, it was enormous I went to the weigh-ins the Irish fans and all of Connor's fans obviously but mainly I guess from Ireland they just took over the entire block Dude, that's people crazy. People were telling me from the whole. People were telling me. One of my friends uh, was up in the. Um, he was in a. He was on a on a business uh, trip nearby, and he was at a hotel nearby the garden. And he said he couldn't. He heard it from inside his room, the chanting all night, from Friday <laughs> night into Saturday. Craziness, man. So yeah, it is huge. It is really huge. And if it wasn't huge before it got there, when it got there, everybody knew it was going down. <laughs> So, no, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was great. Yeah, no doubt about it. And you mentioned uh, the record that they broke. What you're referring to was the live gate, man. They broke the live gate record at Madison Square Garden in their first ever event there. I mean, that's just uh, that's absolutely crazy. I heard they also broke the pay-per-view record, which is great news. Yeah, 20,427 in attendance. And I believe it was like 17.7 mil on the gate. The pay-per-view, I don't know if it, I don't know, maybe you've seen, I haven't seen anything yet. I don't know. I guess we're still waiting to see when that comes out, what the pay-per-view number was. But I, I Dana was saying it from that night, it it was already, it already beat 202. It sounded like he was saying that. Dude, Which, I, got, I got a bone to pick with the New York crowd and tell me what you think about this. But I felt like the New uh-oh. York crowd wasn't as rowdy or as loud as uh, some of the other crowds. Like when Chris Weidman walked out, I was expecting like, the ovation of ovations. I mean, was it just uh, me tuning in at home that I didn't hear it or what, man? I, you know, it probably was. Uh, when I was now, I, I was now here. Now I was at the weigh-ins live, so I didn't get to actually go to the actual fights live in attendance. So I'm not sure how it sounded, but you know, they're live. But I definitely, when I was there at the weigh-ins, it was it was crazy loud, so loud that you know, as we saw, Eddie couldn't even finish his speech. And then, but uh, on the live thing, yeah, I thought maybe. I felt like it could have been louder. Again, I don't know if it was the... I felt the same way, too, though. I think it was... I don't know if it was a Weidman or maybe at the end. Um, I just felt like it wasn't as loud as I thought it was in certain moments. But, listen, the, the, the fans are, are always going to be, you know, as rowdy as, 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 as any other crowd you can get in New York. So, maybe it was the television audio. Yeah, I'm going to blame it on that. Crazy, which didn't sound like... You know, it looked like they were all jumping. I mean, you seen, when you've seen... Either whether it was Rydman or whether it was, uh, you know, Connor's victory, you can see the fans going crazy, but it didn't sound like the audio needed to be pumped up a little bit to match what we were watching, you know? Yeah, let's just uh, stick with blaming their sound guy for this one. But, dude, Connor McGregor versus <laughs> Eddie Alvarez. Yeah. I, I mean, it's absolutely crazy because, look, man, the dudes that have beat Eddie Alvarez in the past, like, you know, Cowboy Cerrone, Mike Chandler, they had to go through some shit before they beat Eddie Alvarez. And, uh, Conor McGregor's over there making it look easy, and one doesn't simply make it look easy against Eddie Alvarez, Matt. I tell you, this is what I was trying to say. He, he toyed with him. I've, I've watched... Conor has been doing this kind of stuff to those kind of opponents his whole career. So it comes to no surprise to someone who sees him doing that. Everybody was talking all this shit like, oh, you know, Eddie is he's going to wrestle him. And Eddie, even Eddie himself said, yeah, that was the plan. But it's very hard to wrestle someone with that kind of takedown defense, you know? And, um, and somehow he draws people into striking with him. I don't know what it is, but, but yeah, the, I, I felt, I really felt like that, that um, Alvarez looked so unprepared, it seemed. 
That's how bad, that's how bad it looks for him, that he looked like he was unprepared and looked like a child was playing with someone. I mean, it, <laughs> it literally was a sparring session for McGregor. He, I don't even think he sweated. Dude, McGregor's spatial awareness and his distance is just on another level because, yeah. I mean, Eddie Alvarez, he threw the exact same right hand that he knocked out RDA with to win the title. He throws that exact same right hand, and, I mean, it misses Conor McGregor by li literally an inch. And that's due to Conor McGregor's uh, just distance and spatial awareness. That has nothing to do He's... with Eddie Alvarez not knowing how to throw because, I mean, when Eddie won the title, it's because this dude knows how to throw. Absolutely. And he has confidence in it, and he should. Eddie should have confidence in his striking. That's why I don't fault him for doing that. I don't, I don't think, you know, people try to say, oh, Eddie didn't follow his plan, and that's why. No, Connor's just that good. Same thing with Aldo. Oh, Aldo made a mistake. No, Aldo did not make a mistake by charging forward. He does that, <laughs> he, he does that all the time. And Alvarez did not make a mistake by charging. This is what Alvarez does. This is what these guys do. It's just Connor's on a different level plane. This is why I was saying on the press conference, my whole point of this whole thing was that, Eddie, you're complaining. You're, you're, why are you talking shit about a guy saying he only has a couple minutes, two, three rounds, when your experience doesn't warrant that kind of talk? And look what happened. You know, eight minutes in, who was the one gassed out? Definitely wasn't Connor. <laughs> True that. And, dude, the so, funniest you know, thing about it. Like I said, you know, point, point proven, you know. No doubt. It's so funny when people ask for, uh, you know, that they want to see an Aldo rematch. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you, you want to see that again? Like, I like Jose Aldo. I don't want to see the guy get knocked out again, you know? Listen, it, it, it's, it's a matter of, of, you know, now at this point, Conor set himself as a two, as a double champ. There's, you know, the Aldo thing becomes more and more distant. However, Aldo is the interim featherweight champion. And he did, before Conor, obviously hold a 10-year title reign it would be i feel the rematch would be a good um would be you know we'll probably see more of a fight perhaps but i feel it's going to go the same meaning although still going to go out cold i just feel like nobody in the featherweight division can mess with connor and i don't think that's i don't think and and i mean jeremy stevens comes up and loses to frankie edgar in a unanimous you know in a decision fight and then you got, you know, who, who I thought would be maybe a challenge for McGregor in the featherweight division. But after seeing that fight and seeing how Edgar was handled by Aldo, and then, you know, so to me, I know, I know, I know MMA math doesn't really, does not sound, it's not logic, you know, because it, 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 every fight's different. Um, but if that rematch would ever uh, surface again, I, I've, I just feel like Aldo, I don't know, I just don't feel like that's the right match to make. That's the right fight, even though he's in line for that unification bout. When you say it's more of a fight, I mean, to me, more of a fight just means that it would go down kind of like Eddie versus Connor instead of, uh, you know, just 14 seconds. Okay, yeah. so he'd, la he'd last into the second round but still get dropped a couple times in the first. Like, just the way the styles match up, it's just not a good one. I mean, it's really hard to get off on your leg kicks against the southpaw, you know, if he wants to change things up and go to that. And obviously, it's really hard to take Connor down. So, yeah, man, I just, yeah. uh, I just don't see Aldo beating him. But here's the thing, man. If he goes back to 45, obviously the Max Holloway rematch, that's one to make. And just the way the styles match up, I feel like Frankie Edgar yes. versus, versus Connor is a great fight. You know, who cares if uh, Frankie lost to Jose? You know, a lot of the fans still want to see Frankie go in there and, and fight him. So I wouldn't be opposed to that matchup either. But, Matt, what I'm thinking here is Khabib Nurmagomedov or uh, Tony I knew Tony you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew, No, I'm thinking the same thing. Because here, maybe, you know... Khabib, I mean, this guy, I'm, he, you know, obviously I haven't seen, we haven't seen much of him in the past few years with his injuries and, and um, not following through with some of his fights because of that, but I didn't think he was going to, like, he stood up against Michael Johnson, and Michael Johnson, I thought, was, was doing pretty well, but, you know, Khabib, he had this, he had this, you know, this stone guard up, he ate through those, those lefts or those rights or whatever it was, right down the pipe. I feel like that's going to be a trouble for him if he fights McGregor like that. I feel like those hits that McGregor will throw on him, if, if, if McGregor was throwing the hits that Johnson was throwing, that clean, I mean, right through the middle like that, I, I don't think Khabib's going to be able to eat those. Khabib needs to adjust that because but Khabib is too confident with his wrestling. I mean, he just literally just goes in and there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no stopping that. I mean, he just, his weight, I mean, he was doing all sorts of shit to, to Michael Johnson, knees on his neck and, um, 
twisting him with the crucifix and then going back to uh, putting his, his thigh over. I mean, he was doing all sorts of things. And I feel like that's going to be very bad for Connor if he's on the ground because Khabib is not small. Uh, so that matchup would be would, would be an interesting matchup. But I feel like the UFC is not going to make that. I don't know. I, I, feel like the, I feel like, first off, there's a lot of things going on right now. We don't even know what's going on yet as far as Connor's next move um, since he made some request about ownership and everything. But, you know, leaving that aside for a second, if he goes against Khabib, I feel like it'll be after Khabib fights Tony Ferguson. Makes sense. That maybe they'll do that matchup first to see who fights. And then, you know, while they negotiate with Connor some, buy some time. Buy the lightweight division some time. Get that fight book. Hold that up for a second. Figure, you know, I mean, they got to figure out what they're doing with the featherweight stuff. But there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure, um, you know, the, the, the brass is... is, is you know, going to have to really put their minds to to figure out and negotiate with Connor, which is going to be very hard now. But I, I just feel like that matchup would be good. But I don't. I, I feel like they're not going to do that until he fights Tony Ferguson first. I don't know why. I just feel like they're going to make that matchup first, Khabib and Tony. Even though Khabib said All right, a title fight or no fight, maybe they'll make an interim lightweight title fight. I'm not sure, but I feel like that's what's going to happen. Yeah, that's a good matchup, and I gotta you know tip my cap to Khabib Nurmagomedov because I mean I was picking Michael Johnson going into this fight. I thought that you know look Johnson's got an eighty-one percent takedown defense, and he's looked better yeah. than ever. He knocked out Dustin Poirier. You know how the fight went early on when Johnson was tagging him up. I thought that that's how it was gonna finish, and man, Khabib. Uh, I mean, dude, what can I say, man? You know he's legit. That's the bottom line. I need he's to legit, find, he... dude. I needed to find out firsthand is this guy legit, and he's legit. So. I mean, that's all I got to say. And, I mean, dude, what's so cool about Khabib is that he might be the most dominant wrestler, just like Connor's the most dominant striker. So, if you see those two matched up, I mean, I don't know if uh, Khabib can take the Connor left hand, but I also don't know if Connor can stuff the Khabib takedown. So, that's why it's so intriguing to me. I mean, yeah. when, uh, when Khabib had uh, Michael Johnson's wrist and he uh, just pinned him on his head, and just started pounding him away like his little brother. Dude, I couldn't believe that shit. I was like, oh, my <laughs> God. So it's like this. You he know was, what I mean? Yo, he was what we call in New York. He was sunning him in the, in the fucking octagon. He was getting sunned in there. Michael Straight Johnson up. was getting sunned by Khabib. Big time. And um, But listen, you know, Connor's takedown defense is extremely high. I still back that up. I still feel like that, you know, these guys who try um, to take him down, you know, people always say, oh, uh, you know, I heard someone on Twitter was like, oh, Alvarez used zero ground game. Uh, excuse me, Alvarez tried to take him down, tried to wrestle him twice in the first round. Dude, they were in the um, ground. I mean, he, Connor had to get out of submission he tried attempts. To wrestle, tried to wrestle Connor a couple times in the, in the second round. So he tried to do it. He just couldn't do it. Connor was just that good with the defense. And that, you know, and, and then again, so then, you know, obviously Alvarez like, all right, listen, I, I have hands. Let's just try to, but it was just too quick. He kept on trying to do that double, either the double jab or the double right. And every time he hit the, when he, when he would hit the first right, he'd swing at it. He'd get caught in between the first and second strike. So as soon as you know, if you watch, as soon as Alvarez tried to pump that double right or double the the, the, uh, the double strike, Connor would hit him in between and knock him down, and you know, and throw him way off guard. And like even Alvarez, like oh, he hit me so fast, I, I just like I couldn't even. I was like, wow, I was on the floor. He was like, wow, that was really fast. And that just shows again the spatial awareness of Connor, his measurement of distance, the range. Um, and then you see Connor getting a little bit more confident as he realized, wow, this is nothing. <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> I mean, it seemed like that's how he was, the way he was seeing, you know, going forward. Like, I ain't scared of shit. This guy is, this is what you got? This is the guy that, ever, this, this, you're the man that was saying that, I don't know why anybody didn't beat me before. And he just kept, you know, coming in at him and, and just exposing Eddie Alvarez's uh, lack of, I guess, level on boxing compared to Connors. Everyone's saying that, uh, you know, Eddie should have looked for <laughs> to take the fight to the ground. It's like, do you understand what you were watching? He did try to look to take the fight to the he ground, did. but he couldn't. And the one time that it did end up on the ground and Connor was on top of him, escaping all of Eddie's submission attempts, passing his guard, and almost knocking him out with ground and pound. I mean, that's a, I mean, Connor did just work him on the feet. He worked him on the ground too. Yes. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, Eddie's response was very, very quick response. As soon as he got knocked down, his feet was up. He was trying to, you know, do his maneuvering, twisting thing. And, and it worked, you know, the first round. It got him through the first round. I felt like, you know, when, when Connor could have finished him in the first round, if he would have let him back up again after the second knockdown, or at least um, 
you know, gave himself a little bit more space because Eddie was just kind of, uh, he was just kind of confusing it. Uh, the, the, you know, make, you know, creating the space so that he wouldn't get, he wouldn't get, uh, he wouldn't get hit so much, but, but yeah, I, I feel like these people try to, and they just can't. I mean, Mendes was successful, you know, granted Connor had a bum knee, but regardless of that, uh, Connor got up as if he didn't, as if it never got taken down. He got up with no, Mendes was more tired, you know? So it's, again, it's the same sequence. It's like, I always tell people, like, Connor's in control. He knows what's going on. They run these sequences time and time again in their training. I've seen these little photos, these little videos, um, you know, before the Mendes fight, a little routine about getting out of the guillotine choke, that little twist that he does. And, you know, you see these guys, and, and, and again, this is the kind of training that Connor faces, these orthodox fighters, these wrestlers, these, you know, as he calls them, overstuffed wrestlers with the overhand. He knows what's going on. He can sense it. And once you're in there with him, I felt that, you know, it's a, it's a different ball game than what you think and what you prepare for. And I know that fighting is, is totally, you know, half discipline, half make, you know, making the decisions as you're going, you know, but when Alvarez, before they, before they fought and they got in each other's face and John McCarthy was reading the rules and giving the quick thing before they touched gloves, one of my coworkers actually pointed this out to me. Eddie looked away for a split second and Connor's eyes was, they didn't budge. And I was told someone, because I had a lot of people who were on Eddie's side at my, you know, when I was at my house, I was hosting the fight. And I said to them, watch what happens when they go face to face right before they fight. That's how you're going to tell who's going to win. You can tell who already won, mentally, I should say. Because um, it's not 100%, but mentally, you can, t- you can kind of tell. Connor was there, right in his face. Eddie broke by looking away. He did it for a split second. You'll see it. Then he, then, then another, the second sign is that he put his fist out. So to me, it's like, yo, what happened to all this talking about your family, talking about your wife, talking about your kid, you want him to apologize. Now you're going to make him all this. And you get to the octagon. It's like, oh, you know what it tells me? It tells me that Eddie really likes Connor. He respects him. And I think Eddie knew this guy ain't fucking around and I'm in trouble. I mean, I don't know. Somehow, maybe not. I'm not thinking he was afraid or anything like that. These guys are not, you know, these are the fighters, but something he broke. At that instant, I don't know when, what, I don't know if it was from the first press conference, from, you know, yours truly, getting his head, including his, oh, I don't know if you saw that, his coach messaging me on, you know, Dude, I mean, an, oh my an embarrassing God. moment for Mark Henry. Yo, and so fuck for, Mark Henry, I don't give a fuck, fuck that fat fuck. <laughs> for I'll people that don't know, Mark Henry literally yeah. sent Matt, like, fuck him. a paragraph, like, of just some shit, man. I feel like he might just not really know... The internet, you know, he's a, he's kind of an older gentleman yeah, that doesn't he probably really doesn't. understand this listen, generation. I, I'm not giving no, listen, Mark Henry, he's in the professional MMA world. I don't give a fuck. No excuses. He does know what he's doing. He's a fucking idiot. And I don't give a fuck if he hears me saying that. You don't sit there and talk about someone's family because they're a fan and they're, and they're just trolling you. Like, who gives a fuck if they're trolling you? Deal with it, you fucking, you're in the business you're in. Seriously, get the fuck out the business if you don't like it. Well, hold That's up. the business you're in. Fans let, are going to talk shit. Let the fans know exactly what happened so that, you know, they know what you're talking about real quick. So, yeah, let me, let me, yeah, let me break it down. So I, 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 um, obviously after the press conference that went down, everybody was, you know, creating buzz about it, whatever, right? And I was trying to be nice about it. But then after that, I was like, you know what, fuck it. So I went on, um, his, I went on, like, you know, I was on my Instagram and I scrolled and I'm, I followed, followed Mark Henry he has since blocked me, and I also follow You know, I follow a lot of fighters and stuff like that. So I saw one of his pages of the training, something about um, ready to go. So I, I put a comment, and I was, my, my comment wasn't even that bad. My comment was simply, yeah, ready to go to sleep, that is. I mean, it was something like that. And, and then I said, I'll be sure to throw my tie in the octagon to help Eddie Alvarez up, you know, when he's knocked out cold. Something like that. I said something like that. You know, just, just a light trash talk. He goes on private message... And then, you know, I have the paragraph written on my, on my Instagram, X-Men underscore P, for those who want to look. And there he is, writing about, uh, you know, hey, you know, you're a piece of shit, kind of. Um, you're a low life, whatever. You're not even a man. I feel bad for your family. I feel bad for your son. Of course, he called him a daughter. My daughter, I don't know, he didn't know what he was doing. So then he, he, he lashed out and, um, you know, took it very personally, went personal. I never went personal with him. I never saw anything about his family or anything like that. And 
he just took it to a you know to a third grade third three year old level, and it just I just thought it found it hilarious that that in, you know I don't know how old Mark Henry is, maybe his mid forties or something. Wait, that, hold up, dude! You got to talk about the part where he asked you to come in and spar Eddie Alvarez. Oh, so yeah, so then he goes like this. So he's talking all this trash, saying I'll never back up my mouth. I'm just a, I'm just a, you know talking shit. I would never in a million years blah blah. He's like, why don't you even come over here and train with us at my gym and go and go half around with Eddie? So <laughs> that's. That's you know, already I said, ridiculous. Really? I, said, you I said, okay. You know, so what was that? I didn't hear what you said. I said, that's already ridiculous. The, yeah, I mean, come on. The, yeah, I'm going to go. Yeah, you're going to challenge a fan to go half around with a professional MMA fighter. I mean, that's, 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 that's insane. So, but listen, I'm, I'm gutsy and I'm ballsy and I don't give a shit. So I said to him, hey, listen, I said, you show me cage side seats and I'll fucking spar half around with your boy. No problem. And, um, you know, of course, he didn't take me on it. And, and you know, I, and, and then he responded back with, you know, and I told him, listen, I'm just a fan who enjoys fights. And, you know, I'm just like every other fan who talks shit. It's just mine just got a little bit of attention. So deal with it, I told him. But then he writes back, I don't have to deal with anything that you're doing. You should be worried about your family more than you should be worried about what we're doing. And I'm like, what? I'm like, you're in the public. What are you talking? You know, so then he's going off with this. And he went on this little paragraph. Anyway, that was it. That was a small thing, but I just felt like that was really like you're gonna go and, and, and take time out of your training for a biggest fight of your life, you know, biggest fight of his life as a coach. You're gonna take time and really, you know, I'm that much in his head, or I'm that much in that camp's head, or I'm that much in that in that. I couldn't believe that. I really didn't believe he was gonna message me like that. Like it was, it took me by surprise. I was like, really? I was like, I, it was ridiculous and it was childish from him, and. That's it. So, fuck him, and uh, he got what he, he got. He got, he got. Uh, you know, the right man won on that night, as I was saying, and all that shit he was talking, all that shit. Now he's eating his own fucking words, and good for him. So <laughs> that's that. Yeah, and uh, Connor. And yeah, give now. me, give me, give me a few. Yeah, give me, give me a few years of training, and I'll fucking go spar with him. And I'll teach him a few things. How about that? <laughs> Connor McGregor is now the first ever dual weight simultaneous champion in UFC history. I mean, BJ Penn had two belts in two different weight classes, but not at the same time. And then he attempted to do it at UFC 94, and, uh, you know, it didn't pan out. GSP beat him. And Randy Couture also had two belts in two different weight classes, but not at the same time. Conor McGregor's holding the two belts of the two most stacked weight classes in the UFC at the same damn time. I mean, it's just unheard of. And, you know, the haters... Well, firstly... Anyone who really understands what they're watching will appreciate that, but the haters who look for any excuse to discredit what McGregor's accomplished will just say something like, oh, but he's never defended his belt. Well, listen, he just, he's just he got two belts now. So yes, he, he did. His next fight by yes, default. Yes, he did. He oh. defended it against Aldo when he was the interim champion. He came in that fight as a champion. He oh, defended his featherweight title December 12, 2015. Now what? I mean, firstly, Defended. By, by default, <laughs> by default, his next fight is going to be a title defense. So, I mean, there you go. For that's, that, that should take the title defense talk out, out, out of the Wait picture. Wait a minute. Hold on, Daniel. Unless, and I know you were watching. <laughs> T-Wood? Woodley. I don't think it's going to happen. I just feel like this is a little, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just feel personally, I feel like it would be a little bit too much to do now. Um, but who knows? You know, he, he can do it all. Why, who says he can't? At this point, because you really can't. Now, that's the, pro, that's the thing with Connor. Who can really say you can't at this point? Because who's done what he's done now? No. You know, but yeah, naturally a title defense. But, you know, who, who, I like, I'm, I'm game to see what happens. You know, he's going to be a dad. Congrats to him. Uh, he's going to learn a lot more, and he's going to fight a lot better as a result of that. So. Uh, if he continues to fight, we know who knows what he's going to do. I don't think he's done yet, though. Twenty-eight years old, um, he just barely got started. I feel, and uh, and I think with his Mac life and all that, I think he's starting to do his own. You know, he's going to start his own promotions, probably. Who knows? You know, like Mayweather and all that. So it's good. It's good. I like the direction he's going. I like what he's doing. I like that MMA is being exposed to these kind of um, these openings. I should say, you know, because it it gives openings. Believe it or not, even though he's only one right now, and really nobody can really be on this level, but. It does give that opening, and I think it encourages other fighters that are in the MMA scene, you know, kind of like the boxers, you know, in terms of, um, you know, kind of mixing the things now with the unions and stuff. But, but basically being a promoter of yourself and, and, and doing it the way he did it. Yeah. 
No doubt about it. I mean, there's never been anything like it before. Sure. I mean, he's the highest paid fighter in UFC history, and uh, it's just uh, making it better for everyone. And man, when you get the chance to fight this guy, I mean, you grab a uh, you grab it with full force, man. Because I mean, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. But yeah, I'm I'm very curious to see how it plays out with the new ownership. You know, we don't really know much, but the only thing I can assume is that look. I look up to the Fertitta brothers, man. I mean, look, I went to business school, not not bragging by saying that. It's just the bottom line. And if I want to look up to other guys that are in the business, it'd be someone like you know the Fertitta brothers. I mean, they're entrepreneurs. Yeah. They're entrepreneurs. They uh, they did it all themselves. And if those guys are willing to hand their company over to someone, I mean, for four point two billion dollars, no less. But if they're willing, to, <laughs> it was if, yeah, it wasn't just a handoff. <laughs> if, they're, if they're willing to give it to someone and they wouldn't just give it to anyone man it has to be someone that understands their vision because they're passionate about this sport they're yeah. fans first so i think that uh you know these guys Ari Emanuel and you know all the other people behind the scenes i think they know what they're doing man and i think it's going to only get better from here on out man i feel like a year from today we're going to be talking about the improvements that they've made in, and we're going to be getting so many more big fights Did, could you tell that this year like pay-per-views went up and the cards have been more stacked and it's just I feel like it's only going to get better from here man they're cutting a lot of like you know the lower level fighters you know, and they they're really doing I'll the right things on man. What Dana, I'll, I'll piggyback on what Dana White said about this because um he was saying you know listen having a double championship fight we we've, we've been doing that now a lot he's like so we had to have New York we couldn't just have two title fights we had to have three you know so, yeah, you're right. I feel like that this, this whole year, the cards have been stacked. But, you know, since the handoff, as you called it, with uh, the Fertitas and, and the WME guys, since the handoff to them, you got you know, you had, you had UFC 202. I believe the handoff was right around there, right before it, or right at that event. And, that was the, and that's the biggest pay-per-view in history, right off the bat. After, they got now this off. one's the biggest in, in history. Now this one is the big. You see what I'm saying? So there. So I feel like you're on the right. Yeah, I feel like definitely these guys. I don't know if these guys. You know whether or not this was already planned ahead of time, et cetera, before these guys got into play. But I feel like to be able to transition that way, and to put on these shows and 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 to get and to break the record, and now you broke another. Now it's like each one is breaking the previous record. It's it, it's a good sign. The two shows that they've got, the two big shows, I should say, 202 and 205. Not to take away from any other um, pay per view events, but you know these big ones, obviously. Uh, have have uh, are, are the ones to talk about in terms of gauging their ownership. Uh, 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 you know, the, part, the gauging the time from when they got took ownership of the UFC and in, into the production of the shows now. So um, you got Joe Silva's leaving, I believe. Uh, and I didn't know Eddie, Eddie is it Eddie Scholl or, or is it Mike? I forget. Um, he's also uh, he's also stepped aside too. Who? Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Who'd you say? Eddie Scholl. I, I know. No, no, I was, oh, Dave Scholler. Kind of. Scholler. There you go. Scholler. Dave Scholler. My fault. Dave Scholler is the one that I was talking about. Yeah, he's also stepped aside. I wasn't. I, I, that caught me by surprise. I didn't even know that was happening. I saw it on. Uh, I saw some people saying his last show. I'm like, what? I didn't even know it was a big thing. I didn't even know he was leaving. So I guess he's going to the Philly 76ers or something like that. But anyway, so so you have the handoff. You got these guys. Um, doing it seems like they're they're at least managing it very well and uh but let's see how they manage connor i don't i, I still to this day don't feel like they've they've had a chance to sit with him and and um do any kind of negotiations yet but we'll see yeah we'll definitely see dude tyron woodley versus steven wonderboy thompson man i gotta oh, give a man. lot of credit to both fighters but especially t wood oh, because yes. t wood's the first guy you know since matt brown to not look like a complete fool when they're fighting Wonderboy Thompson. I mean, he had the perfect game plan, and, you know, a lot of people have criticized him for his cardio, and, uh, you know, even though his cardio isn't necessarily the best, he knew how to manage it this time, and the way he managed it would, was, you know, one round he'd come out, take him down, ground and pound him the entire time, then he'd take a round or two off, and then he'd come back, went, get a 10-8, you know, drop him, almost finish him, and he'd kind of take rounds off. And also, you know, a lot of people were talking about why is he backing himself into the fence? Well, if you've ever watched Tyron Woodley fight, 
he backs himself his plan. up into the fence every single fight because he likes to lure you in so he can he can get you with that blitz. That's how he likes to set it up. And it, man, he really exactly. uh, didn't let. I mean, how many head kicks did you see? I didn't see too many because he didn't really let Wonder no, Boy listen. play his own game, man. And that's that was impressive. I I felt like Woodley won the fight, dude. I I well, you touched on a couple things that I noticed when I was watching the fight too, and I was commenting. Woodley's when he was back into the fence, everybody was saying, why is he doing that? I was like, guys, listen, he's got a close distance on this man. I was like, backing himself to the fence gives him a wall. Now, Wood, uh, now Wonder Boy's got to come closer to him, meaning there's no more space behind Woodley, and everywhere that distance is being closed up, which I feel like that was Woodley's plan because Wonder Boy, if he has that distance with the kicks, forget it. If he has all that space to work with, that's his, that's his, that's his living room, you know what I mean? He's comfortable there. Woodley had to close the distance and somehow ignite some shots to, to kind of shock him. And I think that's what, you know, people were like, why is he backing up the fence? I was like, look, it's part of this man. Watch. He did it so many times. Back up the fence. Wonderboy came towards him. Woodley would, you know, Wonderboy would throw a kick or something like that. Woodley would dodge, slip, go right behind him or, or go, you know, get out of the situation and start landing shots. When he had him almost guillotined, I mean, fucking hard on Wonderboy. But, yeah. uh, you know, I didn't see many head kicks. I was wondering about that. I almost thought, like, why is he not doing too many of those uh if you think of you know and woodley um i mean he i mean i don't know i don't know how he did not win that but i mean in the fourth round when he had the guillotine uh clinched so tight i thought he was gonna pass out at that point but i kept seeing you know what it was wonder boy's shoulder i believe he kept on putting space in between uh, uh in between woodley's um arm that he would use to pull his you know to pull the to pull his wrist so I felt seeing I felt I kept seeing Wonder Boy creating that little bit of space that was giving him that little breathing room, uh, pun, pun intended. So, but yeah, absolutely great fight. Hats off to both to both fighters. Um, you know, I, the draw I didn't really get too much into the decision controversy with that, the whole thing with that. But listen, uh, either way, he keeps his belt, and uh, yeah, and he and he and he gets to you know he gets to to, to move forward. Where he you know what happens next. I believe a rematch would be good. I think I think I'm in I'm in favor of a rematch. I would love to see those guys go at it again, and I would love to really see Wonder Boy. You know, I just didn't feel like he was the same. Um, without those head kicks, I just didn't. I was like, where is those? Why wasn't he not doing those? I mean, I know he did a few of them, and Wonder Boy blocked him, but. I felt like he could have did a lot more. It's because Woodley uh, didn't let him, man. Woodley came out prepared. Most of these guys, you know, think it's a joke because Wonder Boy's a karate guy, but Woodley actually respected him, and he realized, look, this ain't a yeah. joke. I'm going to bring in Raymond Daniels. I'm going to bring in all these high-level karate guys. And that's why he came out prepared, and Wonder Boy didn't look like himself as a result. But, dude, you know what was as absolutely result, yeah. insane? Yoel Romero versus Chris Weidman. I mean, look, Weidman came out, and uh, he was looking fresh that first round and a half, man. I mean, he was picking him apart, which is probably the game plan that Bisbing is going to look to use. He's going to try to emulate, you know, the Chris Weidman game plan for the first round and a half. But, man, once Yoel Romero decided, all right, I know what Chris Weidman's doing now. Now I'm going to fight back. I mean, that sweep in the second yeah. round was just insane. He showed him, look, I'm the more dominant wrestler. And then in that third round, showed that freakish athleticism. And, uh, you know, Chris Weidman, a couple seconds before he shot for that takedown, he fainted the takedown. He did a, a takedown fake, and Yoel Romero sensed it. And then when Chris actually shot in, that's when Yoel timed that beautiful that flying knee. knee slash sprawl. And, you know, it wasn't just the first knee that got him. So as, uh, you know, Yoel threw the flying knee, and then he kind of – did a sprawl motion with his legs, you know, all the way up, and then he landed another knee to the back of Chris's head, and uh, man, and then Chris's head hit uh, his own knee, so he got knee like three times in that sequence, man. It was just uh, <laughs> insane, and then you know, took the subsequent ground and pound, and uh, that's all she wrote. So Yoel Romero versus Michael Bisbing next. Oh my God! Listen, my my my. Oh, for the next, yeah, my my head still hurts from from that hit. <laughs> that Weidman took. Oh my God! You see the the blood that gushed out immediately Man. after that knee. Uh, I I I thought it was a lot more serious than what it was. It was the way it looked, and the cameras were not trying to show it. I saw it. And I was like, oh, come on! But but yeah, he took a fucking beating. And Romero out of nowhere again with his he does this. And I think this is the fifth. Uh, Third I'm round finish, like yep. Third round yep. finish. Knocked out Machida, Bronson, Kennedy. Looks like he's dying in the first and second round, literally. And 
comes out and out of nowhere in the third and just rips him apart with that finish. Yeah. He's a terror, I'll tell you that. He's a terror. He's and he goes special, this man. Thing. He's almost I mean, 40. It's, it's... <laughs> I mean, he looks so in shape. I wonder if, I mean, you know, to me, you, always, you always wonder with these guys. You He's know, Cuban. I don't, to, I don't want to throw, you know, I know we got caught when you saw it with some, you know, with the six-month thing, and I think it was a light, you know, it wasn't that heavy of a... Man, um, Cubans have some freak cat. genetics, bro. But yeah, yeah, it has to be. So, <laughs> yeah, I he, guess he's a freak of nature, man. He's a uh, yeah. He is. Him versus versus Bisbing is going to be awesome. I'm going to have to go with Yoel there, but I mean, I got all the respect in the world for Michael Bisbing, but Yoel's just a bad matchup for him and anyone in the 185 pound division. You know, Bisbing is in a um, he's like in a. It's it, it's so interesting that whole you know how that whole came to be and and but you know listen Bisping's got some heart I think um I think Bisping will 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 give a good a good fight to you all I think Bisping's very you know he'll fight he'll train fight smart we'll see you know I I just don't um you know Bisping's been around for a while it almost seems like he was on his way out before getting the title now he's got the title so he's kind of like on this little you know I feel like he's on this string of of um. Before, this is last you know, like, it's like you got a second win. Yeah, it's like it's like he's on this second win kind of thing from the belt, but I feel like it's gonna fade soon. Not because of anything against Bisping. I love Bisping and I love him as, as and believe it or not, I, I think he's I think he's I love him as a champ even. Um I love when he does his press conferences, he's so witty with his remarks and everything like that. And again, his 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 he got I, I guess you want to call it lucky, I don't know what you want to call it with Anderson Silva and with Hendo, but he definitely wasn't lucky with Rockhold. That was definitely all skill. That was definitely that, that was definitely a, a pressure, and um, and capitalizing on on an opportunity of being underestimated. I feel, but 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 I don't know Romero. He better uh, he better prepare hard for him. Yeah, no doubt about it. And dude, uh, Frankie Edgar versus Jeremy Stevens. I mean, what does it take to knock out Frankie Edgar? I mean, th- you gotta literally bring a ba- <laughs> you gotta bring a fucking baseball bat to put that guy away, man. Frankie is uh, is is one of a kind. I, I don't feel like I still feel like that. Maybe he should go down to bantamweight, but um, but I, I I you know I don't know. Listen, I have a mixed feelings about Frankie, and the, and the, and the thing is this: I've seen him uh, his previous fights. Uh, with Maynard, especially, you know, animal. Um, but lately, I just don't know. I don't know. I just feel like, I just feel like this whole thing with, with, with Connor holding up the division and him not getting his shot. I just feel like that it's changed him a little bit. I don't know. I just feels, it seems like a, I don't know. When I watch Frankie, it seemed like, you know, he got the decision and everything like that. I, it seems like he's, he's wearing out. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on this. Maybe it's just me looking at it. Nah, man. I mean, from some kind of view. It's the fight but he game, dude. He, he doesn't seem. Listen, he did great. I mean, I'm not get me wrong, but I, I just feel like something's missing in his. In it. I don't know what's going. I just feel like something. He didn't look. He look. He didn't look that good. He looked. You know what I mean? Like he. Dude, all the wars, just, man. They add up. They add up. Yeah, and that's what it is. You know, I'm not again. I'm not taking anything away from him, and I don't take. And again, I know I talk. With, I don't take anything away from any of the fight, including Eddie Alvarez. Much respect to him. You know, I, that was my little thing I did at the conference. It wasn't a show. It was just a question. It just got out of hand. And, and But, you know, hats off to all these fighters and much respect. And I know Frankie fr- trains with Mark Henry. And, um, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, yeah. So it, it's got to be from years of, of wars, taking all those damage. It's wearing him down. It just didn't look – it almost like he looked like, wow, I, you know, he won the unanimous decision. And it was it – was, um, it, it looked really hard for him. I don't know. But, yeah, I feel like, I, again, I just don't feel like this. I, I'd like to see Frankie and Max Holloway um, or Frankie and Anthony Pettis. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I want to see one more fight at featherweight. Ed- Edgar and Pettis. I want to see one more. F- yeah. I just want to see one more fight at featherweight for him and see where he's, see where, where you know. But I, I just feel like he'd be better off in Bantam. But, again, I don't know. You got Cruz down there. I, you know, listen, I don't know. I feel kind of like, you know, listen, Frankie became a lightweight champ. Um. I feel like that's where he's at. I don't know. Yeah, no, he could definitely go down to bantamweight. I mean, Cruz versus Edgar is a great matchup. Jimmy Rivera versus Edgar. But if he stays at featherweight, I mean, obviously you mentioned the Holloway matchup. But I think if Holloway beats Pettis, Holloway. he's got to get a title shot. I mean, he's on a 10-fight win streak. But Anthony Pettis Listen, versus Frankie been... Edgar, I love that matchup because, you know, they got history, man. Back when Frankie Edgar was a lightweight champion, 
Uh, Anthony Pettis was the WEC lightweight champion, and if you recall, Anthony Pettis was supposed to get the shot at Frankie Edgar, but then Frankie Edgar and Gray Maynard was declared a draw, so they had a fight again, then Pettis opted to take the fight with Guida, and we all know how that went down, so Edgar and Pettis have history, man, and I'd love to see them battle it out sometime. Interesting, yeah, that was, that's a good connection, I would love to see that, see, that's, that, that's, that's what I think would be good, you know, after Pettis and Holloway get, get it on, no, but then you have Aldo now, what do we do with him, and what's... There's a lot of stuff going on. I feel you know, honestly, I I feel really bad for those who have to make these kind of decisions. These are not easy decisions to make, or to offer, or to promote, or to contract out or negotiate. It's very difficult. I can see it already. What do you do? What do you do with Aldo? What do you do with Pettis if he wins against Holloway or Holloway or Holloway against Pettis? Um, you know, where do you put Frankie then? You put him with the loser of that fight if he's, if he's you know he lost to Aldo. He won against Steven. I mean, there's a lot of matching uh, uh, matchups that that. You know, need to be considered, and hopefully, uh, ultimately, the fans we get what we get the we get the fights we want and we want to see, and and we get you know good matchups and good styles. You know, we, it's it's uh, it's important to be able to do all that and also honor the rankings as well. I know it's very it's a very difficult situation. I think I think the USC is in a very very uh, sensitive um, point in their in their in, in in their business because you're dealing with people who want entertainment and want super fights who have just joined the MMA, you know, UFC scene in the past few years versus you got these fighters who work their ass off. You got Damian Maya, you know, is he going to get a title shot? You got Khabib, obviously you got, you know, um, in the featherweight, you got Max Holloway, you got Aldo with the, re you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's like, how do you do all this? And, you know, obviously you can't keep everybody happy, but it's a very difficult task. And I'm looking forward to seeing how they, what decisions they make for this next year. Yeah, man, I'm super pumped, and uh, I have a feeling uh, they're not going to let us down, man. I mean, we haven't been let down to this point, so I don't see why they'd start now. And, uh, dude, I mean, anything else stick out to you on this card? I mean, obviously, Vicente Luque had a really good knockout yeah. over Bilal Muhammad. I mean, that was very textbook, you know, the one, there two, is one thing. then he blocked the right hand of Bilal and then encountered with the beautiful left and uh, lights out. It was great. I, the, it was a one round, I think it was, for Luque, but... I was going to say one thing that did, that did, and I don't think it's getting enough attention, and it should, because um, we're talking about a pioneer of the women's bantamweight movement in the UFC, and I'm talking about Misha Tate. I know, uh, you know, she lost to her to, to Pennington, and uh, just didn't look too good. I just feel like after that Nunez loss, I don't know, but the fact that she retired, I mean, that's a big deal. And if if she's going through with that, um, she's been ten years, uh, again, one of the pioneers of of women's MMA, putting it on the scene. And uh, I feel like that there should be a little bit more of a, of a respect, attention from others, I guess. You know, I didn't see anything on that. And I think that's, that's one, honestly, I, I don't, you know, there was great knockouts, et cetera. You know, Connor, of course, that was, and I, I just feel like this one is, was overlooked because she was a, she, she, she caused, you know, she did a lot uh, for women's MMA. If you, you know, think about it. She became the champion. She finally got that, that shot, you know, achieved that. And uh, kudos to her. I, I, I'm a fan of Misha Tate. I'm a fan, of, of course, of uh, her assets. <laughs> as well, but um, definitely a fan of, of, <clears throat> of her. I feel like she's a, good, she's a good commentator as well. I feel like she's a good face for women's MMA, and, and um, I don't know, maybe they'll offer her a job doing that. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to see her around more, but that's what came out to me uh, in addition to everything else was her retirement announcement and, um, you know, appreciate all that she's done, and I, and I really think that, that she, uh, you know, she's, she's made her mark and um, again, she got her her title, and uh, good for her. She gets to retire with those accomplishments. But that's one thing that I felt like was something that I'd like to appreciate, and I feel like other people should too. Is you know, give her the respect. She did a lot. She was able to face Ronda twice, lost twice, wasn't able to get that third fight, and um, as much as she wanted it, because again of 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 this again this this decision making of what do we do rankings versus the entertainment factor, and so. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, and much so it's, it's, very hard, it's very hard to manage. It's very hard to manage. It's always great <clears throat> when a fighter retires at the right time. Not, you know, you don't often see them know when to say when, but a good example is Chris Lytle. You know, remember when he fought Dan Hardy? He choked him out. It was an unbelievable war. And then he had the best retirement speech ever, had his kids there. I mean, uh, you know, Misha didn't go out on a win, but she knew when to say when. So much respect to her, man. Yeah, I mean, thought, she was always yeah. gritty. She was always tough. And, uh, yeah, you know, props to her. 
I wish her well. And I think she's going to do well no matter what she, and, and whatever she does next. I think she's going to be fine. Um, love to see her in action again, but who knows? Time will tell. People come out of retirement all the time. Yeah. I, I think she's going to stay in retirement, but I think she'll do well in whatever she does next. Mm. Now, uh, Matt, thanks so much Absolutely. for taking the time to talk to me on Half the Battle, bro. Hey, Daniel, I enjoyed it. Anytime. Love to have, uh, love to be on again. Absolutely, man. Let them know where to follow you and uh, anything else. Yeah, so if you're on Twitter, you can go to M P Morea. That's M P M O R E A. And you can find me there. You can find me on, on Instagram. I already said it earlier. It's X Man underscore P. And then finally, you can find me on Facebook. Just look up Matt Morea. Again, M O R E A. And uh, hey, if anybody's in town, if you're in Westchester County, in New York, Stop by at the Jeep store, Central Avenue Chrysler, and say what's up to me in Yonkers, New York. Love to say hi. Matt, thanks again, brother. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Have a good night. All right. You too, my man. Peace out. There you have it, folks. The Thai guy, Matt Maria, on half the battle to recap UFC 205 with me. And later this week, Sean Carey and I will be back to break down both UFC cards going down this weekend, talking about UFC Sao Paulo and UFC Belfast. So definitely tune into that. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Best Fight Picks. Go to bestfightpicks.com for the plays. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Stitcher. And until the next time, let's cash these bets.